I'm watching Masters of Mindfulness in the Great Courses Plus, and it turns out it's a very good course on emotional intelligence. Did you know that emotions really don't last more than 90 seconds if you don't feed them with any thought? That's the hard part, right? Well, learn about this and more and get a free month of their entire library over at thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash brain. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to the Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Paul Coliani and I am here to help you increase your emotional intelligence so that you can avoid dysfunction, handle toxic situations with grace and ease, and show up as your authentic self. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. Today I want to talk about uh, individuality, at least one portion of this show, in the sense that we lose ourselves depending on what we're doing. And sometimes this can be a good thing. Sometimes it's nice to get away from you. (laughs) Not me getting away from you, but you getting away from you. You taking a break from yourself. You taking a little vacation from you. That can be nice sometimes. Uh, You know, there are several things that we do that helps us get away from us. Is it really getting away from you? No, I don't think it's getting away from you. I think you, you know, we take us wherever we go, of course. But sometimes our lives are made up of people and places that we want to separate from for a while. So when I want to get away from myself, it's really me wanting to get away from what I do on a day-to-day basis or what I'm being exposed to on a day-to-day basis. Uh, And sometimes, you know, to go even further into this, we want to get away from ourselves because we don't necessarily know how to handle certain situations and we become frustrated with ourselves, even unconsciously so. Like, I wish I handled that better. I wish I had said something differently. I wish I had done something differently. So it would be nice to take a break from that person who's not honoring themselves, who's not standing in their integrity and standing up for themselves. It would be nice to get away from that person because that person I'm getting a little tired of. And, you know, we got to be careful with that because if we get tired of ourselves too much, what's going on there? Why is that happening maybe that's something that we need to address. And that's why we listen to stuff like this and read books and go to therapy and talk to friends. We want to find out uh, if there's a better way to handle life's challenges. We want to make sure that we're addressing all aspects of a challenge. We just want to expand our mind so that we have more solutions, more options. And so this is what I mean by maybe taking a vacation from ourselves is that when we do that, we actually achieve clarity. I mean, this is part of the journey of achieving clarity. And uh, it's interesting. I mentioned at the very beginning of the show about um, masters of mindfulness. I think it's important to be mindful just in general, just to be mindful of what you do, what you say, how you present yourself, but not overly mindful, not like you're thinking about it all the time, not to the point where you're obsessed about it. Because that's when we become anxious. That's when we become fearful of other people's thoughts and start feeling somewhat paranoid of what they're thinking about us. And you don't want anxiety. You don't want to walk around in fear and stress and all that. And there is a liberating feeling when you're able to let go and not care. I mean, there's such a liberating feeling when you just don't care what people think about you. That doesn't mean you walk around naked all the time unless you're in a nudist colony or that's your lifestyle. But typically, 
you might be over worrying about things that you don't have to worry at all about. This is one of the things I was able to let go of um, probably about 20, maybe not that long ago, but quite a number of years ago, there was a point that I reached that I just decided that I wasn't going to care. I mean, I, I do care what people think of me. It's not like I'm walking around smacking people that I don't like. Not that at all. But when you think about the feelings of anxiety or stress or being judged, all of this stemming from outside of you, from other people that you are likely planting in your own mind that our real thoughts really don't match reality at all. If you could also plant in your mind that what they think about you doesn't matter, then you free yourself. If you can get into a space where you say to yourself, what they think about me doesn't matter, you free yourself. The anxiety, the social anxiety at least, can go away. Because I think we all know that anxiety in social situations is typically about thinking about what other people think of you. And as soon as you're able to let that go, what people think of you, you unlock the chains that restrict your individuality. And this is full circle back to individuality. When you don't care what people think of you and you just allow whatever they think to be whatever thoughts they have, if they're even thinking of you at all, they're probably too busy thinking of what you think of them. (laughs) If you're too busy thinking about what they're thinking about you, you're probably missing the point that they're too busy thinking about what you're thinking about them, which means really no one's thinking about each other. They're just thinking about themselves. (laughs) <laughs> just so I want to plant that in your head just in case uh, you do walk around any with any type of anxiety because a lot of us think that other people are thinking things about us. And really, uh, who cares what they think about you? I don't care what people think about me, so you shouldn't care what people think about you. I say that, and yet if somebody comes up to me and says, Paul, you're a big jerk, I will be affected. It will hurt. It will feel bad because I try to be good. I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to be myself. I'm trying to be honest and I try to have integrity with people. I try to live morally and ethically. And so when anybody comes along and says, Paul, you're a big jerk, probably using stronger words than that, it does affect me. It hurts me. There's an emotional injury that takes place. And I've been studying this stuff for years and living mindfully for years. I've been very present for years. I've been stress-free in a lot of places in my life. I've been anxiety-free in a lot of places in my life. It comes up every now and then in different areas, but I don't have it in a generalized way. It's not there. I feel pretty good most of the time. And I also have many tools and resources that help me get through those times when I'm emotionally wounded. But the emotional wounding still takes place. And I tell you this because there are people out there that might think, uh, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm, I always get affected by what that person says. That can happen and it probably will happen. I'm not saying that you can't ever get past it. I mean, some people can. Some people, it just runs off them like water. They get called a name and it doesn't phase them. The good news is that once you learn who you are and accept who you are fully and love who you are and you're compassionate toward yourself and you stand up for yourself because you're proud of who you are and you feel like that no matter what happens, no one can tell you who you aren't because you know who you are. And even if they come along and say, this is really who you are, you're not going to believe them unless it's something greater than who you are. (laughs) So if somebody comes along and says, you're lower than what you think of yourself, you're a jerk, you're not that person, you're this person, and it's way below what you think of yourself, you shouldn't believe that person. Because if you think higher of yourself, that is your truth. That is your truth. That is where your baseline needs to be. You as an individual, you as I, You know, bring the ego in here. You as the ego, you as the person, you as, if you're religious, the spirit, the spiritual self, whatever it is for you. 
when you learn to know that you are worthy and you feel comfortable in your own skin being who you are, no one can knock you down. I feel like I'm there most of the time and people do knock me down. So I'm contradicting myself, I know. (laughs) I am contradicting where I am typically and what happens when it shouldn't happen. Nobody should knock me down because, Paul, you know you're worthy. You know that you deserve respect and you know that you are one hell of a guy and you are a good catch. And I want you to think about this about yourself as well. I'm not just saying this to pat myself on the back and say how wonderful I am. There's a lot of things I wish I could improve about myself, but you want to get to the point where you accept yourself, even all your faults, even your imperfections, even the parts you find terrible, dumb, ugly, or any negative thing you say about yourself, all of those things make up who you are, and you really have no choice but to accept most of them. Yeah, there are things we can change, sure, but in general, what makes you up? What has made you up for most of your life? All of these pieces of you. Like there's a piece of me that doesn't want to admit he's an introvert. (laughs) I don't want to admit that because to me, in my mind, calling myself an introvert almost makes me sound uh, unapproachable. And I'm not saying introverts are like this. I'm saying this is what I think of myself. I am completely approachable though. Anyone can approach me anywhere I go and say, hey, Paul, how you doing? And I would say, hey, it's great to see you. How's it going? And I would be, I guess, extrovert in that moment. But for the most part, I enjoy sitting in an office, my home office where I am right now, with the door closed, shut out from the world. (laughs) It's a little strange because I talk to you and you are the world. But at the same time, it is nice to be in this space in myself. And I think it's because I am comfortable in my own skin. I am very comfortable with who I am, even though there are things I wish I could change about myself. I mean, I shouldn't say I wish, but I wouldn't say no if somebody came along and said, hey, I can change that about you. Would you like it changed? I would probably consider it for a few minutes and then say yes. (laughs) But this is who I am. And I want you to be comfortable with who you are. I want you to be in that space where you can say the same things I just said. I'm a catch. I love myself. I'm going to show compassion toward myself. So if anybody comes along and says I am anything less than what I believe I am, I'm going to say, hey, don't believe them. I know you. I know who you are. And I know a lot more about you than they do. That's for sure. Because I've been with you all your life. And I think you're great in every way. So whatever they said doesn't apply. And whatever they said is just something that's in their own head about their own judgments about themselves. Because anyone who creates a judgment about someone else has not learned how to accept qualities and personality quirks or traits about themselves. And you'll find this more often than not. There's often the judgiest, the most opinionated people have thoughts about themselves that they may not tell you, but you can see in their behaviors and what they do. Uh, Bullies are a good example. Bullies are intimidating. They'll call you names or they'll say stuff about you or they'll be very passive aggressive and cause you to feel bad or they'll be emotionally abusive. There's all kinds of things that bullies do. But bullies aren't born bullies. They learn to be bullies because of self-worth issues and insecurities in themselves because they want to figure out how to get their power back. And the way they've learned to do it is by taking other people's power away. That doesn't mean it fills their power meter. It means that if everyone around the bully has little to no power, the bully has power by default. And when people do that to you, they take away your power, they become more powerful by default if you aren't the individual and the I that you know yourself to be. And that's why it's so important to know yourself to be the best damn thing you know. (laughs) You need to be comfortable in your own skin. And I know a lot of people aren't. I know a lot of people, 
they have issues and they have challenges, some physical, some emotional, some mental, some whatever, family and relationships. There's all kinds of challenges out there. But there's a deep part of you that wants to be comfortable in their own skin. And I started off talking about individuality. And I think it's important to remember that we can lose ourselves in the relationships that we create, in the jobs that we take on, in our, in our lives, in our career. We can lose ourselves in excitement. I mean, we can lose ourselves in a lot of ways. And like I said earlier, sometimes losing yourself is a nice vacation from yourself. But what's nice about that is that you get to reconnect with yourself from a different place in a different way, you get to rediscover who you really are when you take a vacation from yourself. And that means sometimes you just need to be away from everything and everyone just for a few minutes even just to reconnect with that person you really are inside. Especially when there's been so many weeks, months, or years of somebody who didn't believe in you or told you all the false things that you might have ended up believing about yourself And all those false things are false because who you were born as is often redefined by dysfunctional people. I mean, why listen to any self-improvement show if you weren't redefined somewhere uh, as anything less than you really are? There'd be no reason. You'd already feel darn good about yourself knowing you were hot stuff. Because you are. You are hot stuff. That sounds odd (laughs) for some people I know. It sounds odd to me if somebody says I'm hot stuff. When my girlfriend says that she really likes a part of me that I'm insecure about, and I'm not talking about that part, (laughs) I'm talking about just different aspects of me that I'm not necessarily uh, 100% happy with, but I have become accepting. When she says stuff like that, it surprises me. And instead of going where I used to go, which was, yeah, you're just saying that because you're my girlfriend, because we do that to ourselves. We say things like that. Yeah, you're just saying that because you love me. You're just saying that because uh, you feel bad that I don't like that part of me. Instead of going there, I instead think, wow, that's really cool. I'm so glad she likes that about me. That's really nice. That's really neat. I love that. And I allow my ego to pull that in and make that a part of me. That doesn't mean I'm fully on board and 100% where she is, but I've gotten one more building block in that area of worth that needs building. I want you to think of those building blocks that you need in your life. And when you get a compliment, allow it to be a building block instead of an opportunity to be self-deprecating. Allow that, allow every single tiny little positive comment or compliment about you to be a building block so that you are building yourself up instead of tearing yourself down. I think that's the most important point of this entire episode. I don't know if I'm going to make any more important points. That needs to be emphasized. That needs to be ingrained in you because I want you to be comfortable in your own skin. I want you to be a happy individual. And happiness, it can be hard to attain. I hear that. I know that. And I understand that. But every single block that you add to your self-worth gets you just a little bit closer to happiness. And there are fleeting moments of happiness that we all experience. I'm sure there are for you. And if there aren't, maybe this is what you need to practice more of. It's hard for some people because they don't believe it. If you don't believe something positive that someone says about you, you need to work on your trust issues. And I'm talking about the people that really have your best interest in mind. I'm not talking about the people that say nice things to butter you up to get you to work the weekend or do something that you don't want to do. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about genuine positive compliments and comments that come from good people that have integrity, that You believe everything else they say if it's about someone else or if it's about something else. But as soon as they say something positive or kind or complimentary toward you, you don't accept it. And I think if you're in that space where you're not accepting these positive comments or compliments about you, that that needs to change. 
You need to build yourself up. I am all about promoting a healthy ego. And this really isn't about ego. And I'm not talking about narcissism. I'm talking about using ego as the gateway to your worth. Because I really believe if you're not using ego and allowing people to compliment you and accepting these compliments graciously and saying, thank you so much for saying that, that makes me feel really good. If you're not using ego in that way, then I don't think you're using it in the right way. I mean, there are other ways to use your ego, of course, but when you use your ego in a healthy way to build yourself up, to make yourself feel good about yourself, all of these building blocks are bringing your self-worth and even your self-esteem where they should be. So if you're not at that space where you feel fully worthy of good things in your life, that might need to be built up. If you're already there, if you feel fully worthy of all the good things in your life, and then you build on top of that, I suppose that might lead to a little bit of self-serving behavior that could go into a more narcissistic space. But I really don't think that anyone listening to this show is in that space. Usually people who have met that level, they're not looking to add more to their worth or more to their self-esteem. I think once you've reached that level, and I'm still working on it myself, once you've reached that level, this is kind of a theory of mine, once you've reached a full level, if that's even possible, of self-worth and self-esteem, and you feel 100% comfortable in your own skin, that you're no longer seeking those building blocks to fill that stuff up, because it's already full. Once it's reached, once you've reached that threshold, I think at that point, you feel abundance inside of you, and giving to others and being helpful to others comes with no energy expense. I mean, you don't have to be 100% to be giving and helpful to others. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that sometimes we are lacking in some areas in ourselves. And even though we give to others, there's often an energy expense. Sort of like if I worked out with heavy weights every other day and my arms were sore all the time. And then somebody called and said, hey, will you help me move something really heavy tomorrow? Uh, a part of me would be like, yeah, absolutely, no problem, because that's the kind of person I am. And at the same time, my arms are so sore, <laughs> and my back is sore. Or maybe I was working on the yard for a few days, and I'm just sore. I wouldn't be at that peak level. I wouldn't be at the threshold of physical strength or physical homeostasis I need to be in order to not expend energy doing that tomorrow. I mean, either way, it's going to expend energy. But when you're lower in the resources that you need to feel good inside yourself and good about yourself, it's usually harder to be helpful toward others. This is why I believe that self-compassion has to come before compassion for others. Self-love has to come before love for others. And that may sound controversial. That may sound like, well, that's not right. You should love others no matter what. You should be compassionate toward others no matter what. But my only issue with that is that you will expend so much energy giving compassion and giving love toward others when you are lacking in it yourself that you could probably do it a couple times and then you're going to burn yourself out. And that's my only issue with this. It's the same thing that people pleasers deal with is that they want to help others and they want to see people happy, but they don't honor themselves to the point where they are abundant in self-compassion and self-love because they've given so much away and the people pleaser will typically burn out helping others and being giving and things like that. So the people pleaser then tends to avoid situations and avoid people and doesn't want to talk to them. I'm just naming, I'm sure, specific people pleasers. Maybe not you or somebody else that's listening. I'm talking about certain people that when they do this, because I used to do this, I would give of myself so much that I would start to burn out my relationships, all kinds of relationships. So I didn't want to do it anymore. And that's because I wasn't focused on myself. When people asked me to do something and I didn't want to do it, I didn't honor myself and say, no, I can't do that. You're moving that heavy thing tomorrow? Uh, I can't do it. I just worked out, or I just spent the entire day yesterday in the yard, and my arms and my back are so sore, and I know if I do it, it's just going to push me over the edge. I, I'm so sorry. 
I'll tell you what, I'll come over and I'll buy the pizza. <laughs> I'll do something else, but I cannot move that. I, that's honoring yourself. You know, that's what I started doing is just starting getting into alignment with what was right for me. And that's what helped me start inserting those building blocks where I needed inside of me. It's all about honoring yourself. It's all about honoring who you are and really allowing yourself to be who you are. So when it comes to being an individual, this is why it's so important that you don't lose yourself in a negative way, meaning you don't want to disconnect from who you are. You want to make sure that you have those building blocks and you're continuing to build on those building blocks as needed and as you experience them. Allow yourself to build these blocks. Allow yourself to feel good in your own skin. And don't let anybody take that away from you. Don't let other people start taking away your building blocks. When you have this foundation of who you are inside of you and you let other people take away those building blocks, you suffer and they become more powerful by default. They're not powerful, but they become powerful by default because you feel weaker in yourself. You start to lose your empowerment. You start to feel less worthy and less important and less significant. And the more that happens, the more stress and anxiety and all the other bad stuff that you don't want to feel happens. And I never want you to feel that way. When we come back, I'm going to talk about somebody losing themselves or trying not to lose themselves. It's a quick email we'll go through, and I'm sure there'll be some good learnings in there. We'll be right back after this. mentioned it right at the beginning of the show it takes about 90 seconds for an emotion to show up and then go away i'm already hearing people say yeah right (laughs) it's true though but the caveat is you have to put no thought toward it whatsoever that is tough that is the hard part and that's why i am grateful for courses like this masters of mindfulness it is one of the many 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 courses in the great courses plus I share it with you here because I am learning so much in all of the courses that I've been watching and you get an entire month of this. I mean, this is a great opportunity to just at minimum check out all their courses. And of course, when you stick around after a month, you still get access to all their courses and you get the new ones that they create. And almost everything that I've watched has been worth it and I've learned something new every time love learning new things because uh, it makes me more comfortable in intelligent conversations. (laughs) But it also improves my life. I mean, I teach emotional intelligence and yet I never thought about how long an emotion lasts. And if you want to learn about that stuff, I recommend going to thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash brain. The one I'm watching is Masters of Mindfulness, but they have all kinds of courses, how to play guitar. They have some psychology courses. They have some music theory courses, uh, and they're all professionally done, high-quality courses. They have an app that you can take with you on your phone. You can either watch it or listen to it as you're doing things. It's all really fascinating, and talk about those building blocks. You get to build who you are from the ground up sometimes with some of this stuff because learning something new expands who you are. And this helps you present your best self to the world. Whether it's about mindfulness or learning how to incorporate values-based goals or learning about self-compassion, all the stuff that I talk about in this show and more at The Great Courses Plus, head over to thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash brain. You'll get an entire month access to all of their courses. You can watch it anywhere, anytime, on any device. This is 2021. Let's make this year one to remember instead of 2020. Let's just move forward. There were so many challenges. Let's move forward and really improve ourselves in every way possible. Thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash brain. Get your entire month of unlimited access for free. You don't want to pass this up. Thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash brain. And when you're done soaking in all that knowledge, 
take a break. <laughs> take a break. Sometimes you do need a vacation from yourself. You need to give yourself a break. One of the methods I use besides just sitting in nature is playing apps on my phone. And I know you never hear about that in um, mindfulness classes, <laughs> but everyone needs a break. And I like to take a break with Best Fiends. You've heard me talk about this before, and if you haven't, Best Fiends is a casual mobile puzzle game that's free to download, and uh, you won't be able to put it down. It is fun and engaging, and when I need to take a break, take a vacation, even from myself, one of the things I like to do is play Best Fiends. It's a top-rated mobile puzzle adventure game, and it will give you hours of fun. It never gets old, and it gives you thousands of levels, so there's always something new there. And if you want to go from mind full to mind less, and I don't mean that in a bad way, it's just you can let go for a while. You can be in the zone while you're standing in line at a store or sitting on the couch at home. Wherever you are, you're going to love Best Fiends. There's tons of characters to collect. There's always a puzzle to solve, and the fun never ends. Just don't blame me if you become slightly obsessed. Download Best Fiends for free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, best fiends. Download it today. Welcome back. Like I said, I'm going to read you an email regarding individuality. I don't think he says this in the email, but I'm just going to go ahead and read some of it here. Uh, Hey, Paul, I hope you could give me some advice on my unhappy situation. My mind is quite scrambled, and I'm sorry if my message is all over the place. I'll try to write the key points. In short, I can tell that my problem is that everything is good, but I feel unhappy. I was with a woman for a few years, and we split up because we didn't know what we wanted from life. Our life goals were different, and our hobbies and interests as well, with just a few similarities. We started talking, and then we decided to get back together and give it another shot. Uh, But here's the actual problem. When I think about how everything is now, because they're back together now, at least when this message was written, uh, it seems okay. I know we could go on as a couple. We both trust each other. We listen to each other. We support each other. But I still feel unhappy. I think I'm not sure what I want. I miss her when she's not around. We don't live in the same place. But when I'm with her, there's a lot of things about her personality that irritate me. There are things in her personality that won't ever change, like the way she talks, or she won't even take the smallest advice on some mundane task, and a lot of small things like that. Also, I don't usually feel like doing anything with her, you know, watching movies and stuff. I even feel bad for saying all this. I love her, but there's a lot I don't. It's felt really good being in my own place and living on my own terms. Before we got back together, I had started to feel okay, not lonely anymore, and making my own plans for the future but this is where I'm confused. I'm back in this relationship. It logically seems great, but I'm not mentally 100% in it because I'm still in that single state of mind that I had before getting back together. I was getting so excited about things that I was going to do being single, like get a dog, but right now we have cats, which I love, but we can't have both right now. There are small things like that, which I wanted to do, but it doesn't fit into our lifestyle now that we're back together. I was maybe getting excited about meeting other people as well. Sometimes I think we should try going our separate ways and live our own lives, but I feel in my gut that I would realize it was a mistake someday down the line. I listened to your podcast about what ifs, and after that podcast, I felt really good about being with her, but these feelings have crept up again. I'm sorry for the scrambled text. I'm so confused. My mind is all over the place. I hope you can get some kind of sense from this. Thank you for your time. Love the podcast and the help you're giving people. All right, thank you so much for writing that. And um, this message is a little older, so this situation may have changed. But I read these situations because they can be very common for a lot of people. You might be experiencing this now. You may have experienced this in the past. But either way, I'm going to give this person my thoughts. The first thing that stands out to me is that there are so many things that irritate, I think it's a guy, that irritate him about her that they kind of permeate his thoughts over everything else. And he also mentioned loneliness, like I'm not lonely anymore. So you could have something going on with that as well, like uh, at least I'm not lonely. There's a lot of people that will get into relationships just so they won't be lonely and they'll take the bad stuff with the good because they're not alone. I'm not putting that down. I'm saying that some people do that. Some people 
can be okay with that because it's better than being alone. And if you're in that space and you can do that, then great. You know, if that works for you, that's great. But here's the thing about um, the irritations. I believe in relationships that when there are irritations, along with the good stuff, you've probably heard me say this before, but I look at the 50-50 rule. If more than 50% of the time you're happy, then the irritations can usually be uh, accepted and glossed over. Meaning, the little things irritate you, but if you're happy more than 50% of the time that you're together, then the irritations don't stand out really much. I mean, they're there, you know they're there, but when they happen, you're able to just acknowledge it or accept it and move on. That is the kind of relationship that usually can get through the thick and thin. It's when the irritations make you unhappy more than 50% of the time. That's when the relationship usually has less of a chance of working out. That's just a philosophy or a rule that I use for myself. If I'm happy more than 50% of the time in the relationship, then all the negative stuff that happens It's just part of being in this relationship and I've learned to accept it and be okay with it. And I think that's important. You have to be okay with the negative stuff because more than 50% of the time I'm happy. And 50% is such a low number. I really like to put it for myself at 90%. (laughs) I'm kind of a 90-10 guy. If more than 90% of the time I'm happy, then all the other stuff really doesn't matter too much because I'm 90% happy. In fact, I think I need to change that. <laughs> it's got to be the 90-10 rule for me. Uh, for other people, it might be 80-20, 70-30, whatever it is for you. I just think that when you are unhappy more than 50% of the time, then there's a problem. Because even some tough relationships, if you're happy more than 50% of the time, then you could probably figure it out and work it out or you know do something with that. But when it gets below 50%, you're unhappy more than 50% of the time. Now there's an issue. I see that as a breaking point in a lot of relationships. And all of the irritations and frustrations and everything that bothers you about the other person becomes prominent. And when those things are prominent, what do you want to do? You don't want to deal with them. You're just hoping that they'll change or not do those irritating things again. And they're always on your mind. And when they do those irritating things, they linger inside you. They're like emotional drills drilling into your brain and or your heart and it stings or it's frustrating and you just can't get them out of your system because oh they did it again and it bothers you i think when you're constantly bothered and the emotional negativity lingers what you're dealing with is a unhappy more than 50 percent of the time situation and if you're unhappy more than 50 percent of the time that's a relationship that you might want to consider changing or at least talking about I mean, I believe that full expression first is the best way to go. So you're in a relationship with somebody and you say, you know, I'm not happy. Because if you're unhappy more than 50% of the time, you're not happy. So maybe a conversation starts like that. I'm not happy. I'm not happy in this relationship. And they may say, what What? What do you mean? What's going on? And then you can have a conversation about it. And that conversation could lead to something productive. Maybe you've both been unhappy and you just haven't brought it up and you need to talk about it. This is where another philosophy I use in my relationships comes into play. My philosophy is you express things even at the risk of losing the relationship. I think it's so important that you express how you feel and what's on your mind even if it's going to make that other person upset and yell at you and even cause them to rethink the relationship. I know that's a dangerous place to go, but you have no idea how it strengthens the bond when you get through that. If you can share stuff that you know is a risk to the longevity of the relationship, it actually strengthens the bond. And if it doesn't, if it does lead to a breakup, then what you have or what you had may not have been enough to survive any other challenges or at least some of the harder challenges that come along. And I'm not saying it wasn't good. I'm just saying that if you aren't with someone, if you're in a romantic relationship, that is, if you're not with someone that you can't express the hard stuff to, 
then how are you going to tackle the challenges together when they come along? And when you express that hard stuff, like I said, the bond strengthens, but also the trust. And when you're with someone that you can express almost anything to, even the hard stuff, They're going to feel safer with you. They're going to know that you are a person of integrity, that you're a person of honesty. And no matter what happens, they're more likely to have more faith in you and your word because you've been honest all the other times before. And I mean, that doesn't give you a free pass to be a liar. I'm just saying you strengthen the bond because of this. You strengthen the bond by expressing things that are very hard to express, especially to someone that you might offend. It's like the very first few months that I was with my girlfriend. There was a point where she couldn't even look at me when I walked in the door and she would barely talk to me and she wouldn't kiss me. And I thought to myself, what the heck is going on with her? She's so distant and disconnected. And uh, she didn't want to tell me something that she thought I would be upset by. And I finally stopped her. This was a few days into it. I finally stopped her and I said, look, every time I come in the door, you don't look at me. You don't want to kiss me. And when you do, it's just a quick peck on the cheek or something. And there's clearly something wrong here. What's going on? And she said, well, you know that thing you said a few days ago? Well, I, I think I'm still upset about that. And I said, what thing? Let's talk about this. I really wanted to know. And she said, well, you said this, and you didn't do it, and you said you would do it. And I said, that's what this is about. This is what's been going on with you, is that you've been upset about that. I I said, you know, first of all, thank you for finally telling me. And second of all, this is what I thought happened. This is how I interpreted it. And it was a big misunderstanding or miscommunication. And once she got it out of her system, she changed almost immediately. We were reconnecting, the bond was strengthening again, the emotional connection was there, and uh, I felt better, and she felt better, and there was no more trying to avoid a touchy situation. Now, she was trying to either spare my feelings or just avoid conflict or anger, whatever it was for her, she didn't want to deal with it, but it took many days of our disconnection and me not knowing where she was. It was sort of a form of silent treatment, but not in an emotionally abusive sort of way. She just was trying to figure it out and not trying to create the conflict, which of course included compassion. She didn't want to upset me. But of course that led to that disconnect. And uh, when you're disconnected like that, because you're not fully expressing what's going on, it can lead to other things, especially if it never comes out. So I kind of made a rule at that point. I said, no matter what, no matter what's on your mind, even if you have to tell me something that you know will get me angry, even if you think I'm going to break up with you on the spot, please don't do that again. Just share with me what's on your mind. And she asked me, really? You really want me to just tell you what's on my mind? I said, yes, please. It's so much better just putting it on the table, talking about it so that we can resolve it and uh, move on. Otherwise, I don't know where you are. You don't know where I am. And it's just a big mystery. And of course, there's tension. Let's just put it out there and see what happens. And she said, well, all right. (laughs) All right, I'll do that if you want. I said, yes, I want to. And I've told this story before, so if you've heard it, but months later, something else happened, another miscommunication, another misunderstanding, something unintentional that I did or said. And for a few hours, I think she was in that space, but then she said, you know, you told me to tell you when something was on my mind and I was upset about something. I said, yeah. I just opened my heart. I didn't say, you know, what's wrong? What's your problem? I opened my heart. I stepped into that non-judgmental safe space for her and I just listened. And she said, well, when you said this, it really upset me. And I said, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I definitely didn't mean it to upset you. I definitely didn't mean it to be hurtful to you. And this is what I meant. You know, we have a conversation. And to be able to just talk about it, talk through it, even if there's upset involved, strengthened our bond, strengthened her trust in me, strengthened my trust in her, although I think I had more for her than she had for me. And uh, we just were able to connect at a deeper level every time something like that happened. Because, and this is the main reason, 
because she felt safe telling me almost anything. And I think that's a great place to be in any relationship. When you feel safe enough to tell someone almost anything, that's when you're comfortable in your own skin because you don't have to be anyone else for that person. You can be yourself. I don't even know why I went off on this tangent. <laughs> I may look back here at this email. Uh, I still feel unhappy. Um, oh, yeah, it was about the irritations and the individuality. So let me talk about individuality really quick. So this is a, a good example of maybe losing a part of yourself or losing yourself in a relationship. He got into a relationship. Yes, he probably did because he was lonely, but this isn't the perfect partner. But it could be if there were some changes, but he's just not all into it. There are a lot of things that irritate him. One of the things I talk about with irritations is that when you are in a great relationship and there are irritations, those irritations won't linger inside of you. They'll just be irritations in the moment and then you move on. Oh yeah, he or she always leaves their socks on the floor, but everything else is so darn good that I can handle that. It's like a tiny annoyance. It's a tiny irritation. And no matter how many times I tell them, they still don't pick them up. But everything else is great, so I'm going to be okay with that. So I'm happy more than 50% of the time, and I'm okay with that. So that's the irritation problem. If those irritations don't linger and everything else is pretty darn good, then that might be a good sign that the relationship will work. And, of course, you talk about the irritations, of course. That's probably where I went into the um, expressing almost anything to the other person even at the cost of the relationship if it goes that way. Because you want to be able to talk to someone and build that trust and build that connection and know that you can tell them anything and have a conversation about it. If you do that with someone and you can't have a conversation about it and they get all defensive and it never goes anywhere and then you both end up upset, you have other issues going on. That might require couples therapy. That might require some other intervention of some sort or someone putting their foot down and saying, look, I bring this up so we can have a talk about it and you just get all defensive. If you don't want to talk about it, then maybe there is nothing to talk about. Maybe this relationship isn't going anywhere. You know, there's some honesty right there. I'm not saying that's what you do say to them. I'm saying there's a point where if you can't safely express yourself to someone and have a productive conversation on it eventually, then you have to consider the relationship that you're in and if it's really worth your time, to be quite frank. I don't want to put any ideas in anyone's head. I'm not, not here to promote divorce or separation or anything like that. I just want you to be happy more than 50% of the time. So that's my take on the annoyances and the irritations. With the individuality, let me make this final commentary on the individuality. I think it's important that you retain as much of your individuality as you can. And sometimes that does require having someone in your life that isn't there 100% of the time. So this could mean for this person that the things that he does like about her, maybe he can fit those things in his life, and if she's okay with it, they can have that type of relationship. Let me clarify that because some people are going to misinterpret that. What I mean is that when you have someone in your life where some things fit some hobbies, some preferences, some sometimes you like the same movies, that you can have a person in your life in that regard, but not in other ways. And the example is, uh, she has cats, he wants a dog. You may not be able to live together, or maybe it'll work out, some cats and dogs get along, but let's just say that there are other things that you don't want to make compromises on because you want your individuality. You are really comfortable in your own skin. You love being who you are. And you still want somebody to share experiences with and be with in life and call when you've had a hard day or whatever. But you have these differences that are different enough that if you were together, the compromises might be too big and too intrusive on your individuality. And when that happens you may have to fit in each other's lives in other ways. This can work. This does work for a lot of people. There are people that have their own hobbies, their own habits, their own lifestyle in general that have other people in their life to fit in different areas of their life. 
just like having friends. If you want friends that you go fishing with and you want friends that are in a book club, that might be two different sets of friends. So you're not inviting people from the book club to go fishing unless they want to. And you don't invite people from your fishing club to go to the book club unless they want to. Because they're two separate parts of your life. And you'd probably be bored fishing with the people in your book club. (laughs) Maybe. I mean, just throwing this out there as an example. You could get bored with certain people in certain environments. This is like when you have a work friend. For me, I've had work friends all my life. When I used to go to a job outside of my home and work my nine to five with usually a lot of overtime, I would make friends at work. But I never really wanted to hang out with them outside of work. But they were great work friends. I loved going to lunch with them. I loved talking with them throughout the day. Great work friends. But I didn't really have the inclination to call them up after work and say, hey, let's go bowling. I wasn't a big bowler anyway, but you know, I just didn't want to connect with them in that way. Sometimes you'd have a call outside of work, but they weren't my best friends. They were good people, and I really enjoyed their company, and I would like to see them again. But I had work friends, and then I had friends outside of work. So that's what I mean by this, is that sometimes there are relationships that we get into that they fit in certain areas of your life in a certain way, but they don't fit in other areas. So with this person who wrote, he says he's not happy all the time and and he's got all these irritations about her. I'm getting the vibe here that you are losing some of the individuality that you really like about yourself. You are losing some of that I the one who is you, the person that you have built yourself up to be, and the person that you want to continue to learn and grow and evolve so that you can be more of who you are and who you want to be. And some people don't fit into that mold. Some people come along and they hinder that or restrict that about yourself. And when they do, you really have to question if this is the type of person that you can afford to have in your life. It's not always an easy decision, and it's not always doable, or at least right away. But it is good to consider that maybe this person doesn't fit into my life the way I want them to fit. So with this person who wrote, the best thing I can say is stay living apart, because living together will probably drive you crazy. And if you continue to see her, maybe you should have a conversation about everything you like and love about her and the way you enjoy her in your life. And I'm not sure if you should have a conversation about all those things that irritate you about her. I mean, you can. You can certainly bring up, hey, when you do this, it really irritates me. You can do that for sure. But maybe just focus on what you like and then you stay together and emphasize those things that you like. And then you connect in that way. And sometimes that can evolve. Sometimes that can go even further and expand into something greater because you start to realize that you like the same things or you're expanding your own horizon here and you're starting to resonate with her in more areas of life and then maybe you can get together in a different way so that might be a path for you as well but the whole point is you know if you have these people in your life and they only fit in a certain way you try that out you try to see if that works it may not work you try this person and see if they fit in your life and maybe it'll work for both of you But certainly, if someone's irritating you in certain ways, and you're in their life even with all those irritations, it's probably not good for them either, or fun for them either, if their behaviors irritate you and you're showing up in the relationship as irritated. (laughs) So it is helpful for them, too, to not have someone that's irritated at them all the time. So this is what I mean, is that sometimes you can have people in your life that fit in a certain way. I'm sure we could expand upon that even more, but I'm going to leave that there. And I'm going to talk about one more thing that you said in your email, which is, I'm not sure if I should uh, continue this relationship because down the line, I might regret it. You said, I would realize it was a mistake someday down the line. I think it's so important that you look at today and ask yourself, what is happening today? Just ask yourself that. What is happening today? Not what might happen, because you're making that up. What is happening today? And then when you answer that question, you tell yourself, this is the exact same thing that's going to happen tomorrow. 
That's it. You ask yourself what's happening today, and then you tell yourself, this is the exact same thing that's going to happen tomorrow. And if you have to say that tomorrow, the same thing, what's happening today, this is the same thing that's going to happen tomorrow. Then you have the outlook that you need to make the right decision. That's gold right there. (laughs) That's gold. You want to look at what you have today because everything in the future is made up. So you ask yourself, what do I have today? And then you tell yourself, this is the same thing that's going to happen tomorrow. And then you say, I need to make a decision based on what I know from those two things. I know this is what I see today, and I know this is going to happen tomorrow, so my decision has to be based on that, and solely that. Not with every decision. Some major decisions require more planning. I understand that. But when you're in any type of relationship that you're questioning, you're not sure, then you ask yourself that question, and you follow it up with, this is the same thing that's going to happen tomorrow, and you're going to get your answer. Because all you can do is base decisions on what you see in front of you not what you imagine might happen. When you base decisions on what you imagine might happen, at least most decisions, when you do that, you end up living a very stressful life. You end up questioning yourself. You end up procrastinating. You end up worried that you're going to make the wrong decision. And all of that can go away when you make decisions based on, well, two things actually, what has been happening, the pattern of what has been happening, and what is happening today. Because that is going to be the trend. In almost every case, you want to look at the trend. What has happened? What is happening today? And then tell yourself, this is the same thing that's going to happen tomorrow. So I'm going to make my decision right now. That's what I have for you. Thank you so much for that email. And thank you for listening to another episode of this show. I am so glad you are here. We'll be right back with my final words right after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to remind you to go to thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash brain and get a month of their entire library for free. Thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash brain. And when you're done learning all that amazing, wonderful stuff, go to the Apple App Store or Google Play and download Best Fiends. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. That'll help balance out your life a little bit. And I also want to thank the financial backers of this show. These are the patrons of The Overwhelmed Brain. They are Robert, Kim, and Daisy, and Julie, and Deborah, Stephen, David, Michelle, Brad, Clarissa. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your monthly contribution to the show. I am very grateful for you. It's so wonderful to see your names every week. I read different names every week, and I call them the patrons of The Overwhelmed Brain because they are patronizing in a good way. (laughs) Thank you all so much. And I want to thank Bob. Bob wrote and said, your podcast has been life-changing. I hope you get a thousand emails like this. You deserve it. And then he gave a very generous donation. Bob, thank you so much for that email. And thank you so much for that very generous donation. I am grateful for you. And I am so glad that you got something from the show and that you find value in this show. Very honored that you uh, followed up that email with a donation. That's definitely not required. I don't tell people to do that. It just came out of the blue. So thank you, Bob. I am grateful again. All of the financial support goes right back into the show so that we can keep going. We're on year eight, eight years of doing The Overwhelmed Brain. And if you've been listening and getting value from this show and you want to give back and you can give back, head over to moretob.com. And there's a couple options over there. And of course, if you are a monthly patron, you'll get access to the patron program, which is a membership site where I have like 100 uh, private episodes that aren't on the air. They're not public. I have a video archive in there where I talk about um, other things that I haven't talked about on the show and some free workbooks in there. So there are all kinds of freebies in there if you become a patron as well over at moretob.com. Thank you, patrons. And Bob, thanks for donating. I appreciate all of you. And I want to mention the Love and Abuse podcast. That is another podcast that I do. I've been doing it since February of 2019. I talk about emotional abuse and control and manipulation and toxic relationships. That is the place you want to go if you are unhappy more than 50% of the time in your relationship. That is where you're going to learn a lot about how you should be treated and 
how you should treat others as well. It's a, a way to help identify poisonous communication and toxic behavior. And that's important if you are in any type of relationship, romantic, platonic, family, doesn't matter. They're all important and they all have their uh, complexities. So I talk about all those complexities over at loveandabuse.com. And finally, thanks to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. And my final words are going to pertain to the last episode I created on how to, um, what do they call it? How to, something about passive aggressive people. Oh, the secret to making passive aggressive people less aggressive. So I came up with a, a resource or a tool or a technique that you could use when you're dealing with passive aggressive people and it has to do with helping them become more detailed. And uh, what that means is when people are passive aggressive, they love to stay ambiguous. They love to stay vague because they don't want to be responsible for telling you what to do. They don't want to be responsible for being the bad guy. So they're very passively aggressive in the way they say things or do things. And so I put that episode out and it got a lot of downloads really quickly. (laughs) And I think it's because... What I talked about in there apparently works, and I've gotten feedback already. Somebody wrote to me, and I won't mention her name, but she says, wow, I used your exact advice, and it worked like magic. Um, I used to listen to your podcast a lot several years ago when I was working my way out of, out of depression, uh, and I learned a ton of new emotional and relationship skills, and it was very help during that phase of my life. Uh, But I've only listened once in a while since that period. But randomly, a day or two ago, I just happened to listen to the latest episode about making passive-aggressive people less aggressive. And last night, my partner said something really passive-aggressive. And I won't say it just in case her partner listens. But she said, well, I almost ignored his comment, but I instead remembered your podcast that I just listened to where you asked, what did you mean by that? And uh, almost immediately, he apologized. And I said, you know, that sounded pretty passive aggressive. And he admitted it. He admitted that he was being passive aggressive. And she also said, it sounded like you have an issue in what I'm doing. And uh, she said that it was almost like he had mental whiplash or something because of how he was suddenly seeing his own behavior and how toxic it was. She said it completely changed the conversation. It stopped the passive aggressive behavior without creating additional tension. This is an incredible tool. I will now have it forever. Thank you. Thank you so much for writing that. And I'm sharing this with you today because if you haven't heard that episode on passive aggressive behavior, I think it's an important episode to listen to because I've also heard from people who are being or have been being passive aggressive as well. And sometimes you don't know you're doing it. So A, thank you for writing that message. I'm so glad that worked for you, that technique, because I do believe that when passive aggressive people are put on the spot and they have to explain their behavior or their, what they said, they're going to feel so awkward and so out of place that they'll very likely not be passive aggressive as much in the future or at all, especially if you keep calling them out on it. So the techniques I talk about in that episode are good for you. If you are dealing with somebody who's never direct And they're all just kind of giving that emotional jab in the back of your head. (laughs) And you're not sure if they really are being aggressive or if they're just trying to make a joke. This really nips it in the bud, so you can check that out. But I read that letter because I wanted to say that's awesome that the tool worked. I like that kind of feedback. And also to be aware of our own behaviors as well. Because I did hear from other people that said, that's me. I didn't even know I was being passive aggressive. That's so good to know. This is going to change everything. I'm going to start changing how I respond and say things to people because I have been being indirect and it's affecting my life. So thank you for this tool. So it works for both sides of that. And the reason I'm saying this is because it really fits in with what I was talking about earlier. You know, it really fits in with the idea of expressing things even at the risk of the relationship. The direct communication that maybe most people should have so that there are no mysteries there's no making things up in our own heads there's no misinterpretations even though there still will be at least you'll get to the point where you're more clear and the other person knows that you're trying to be honest you're trying to be direct instead of playing those age-old mind games those age-old mind games there's a point where they just they just wear you out 
And this is where you want to make sure that you don't get sucked into those games. So there are several episodes where I talk about uh, better communications or more effective communication skills that can be very helpful if you find yourself in mind games. In fact, I don't know if I have an episode on mind games. I might have to do that someday if I don't. But there are a lot of episodes where I talk about better communication skills and they will probably be very helpful to you. At least I hope they are. I'm glad you made it this far. (laughs) You're at the end of the episode. And when we're at the end of the episode, there's one thing that I want to remind you of. I just want to remind you to keep an open mind. This will help you step into your power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. Amazing.